Hello, my name is Vanessa. I'm from Northeast Ohio. I'm 46 years old. I'm one of seven children born to a brother and sister. I found out when I was nine years old that my Jehovah Witness parents are siblings. I was in third grade. I didn't really understand that that was right or wrong. I yeah. didn't. I didn't know. And actually, my my grandmother was happy about it. I that her children found somebody to love. And it just kind of became normal. Mm -hmm. Did your parents tell you? My mother told me. Okay. She uh, she actually liked talking about it. My dad, I think he would have took it to his grave, but yeah. my mom, I don't know why she wanted to tell people. Mm -hmm. But um, now we're all, you said that you were one of seven siblings? Yes. So all of you guys were the children of your mom and dad who are brother yes. and sister. Okay, yes. got it. Yeah. And um, they actually um, did have a marriage certificate because they went to the courthouse in it was 1974. And I guess back then they didn't have to, you know, show a lot of ID. They mm -hmm. had different last names. They did have different fathers. Okay. But um, so they went to the courthouse and my dad put down that uh, he made a fake name for his mother on the marriage certificate mm -hmm. form. And they swore under oath they were no closer of kin than second cousin. And they walked out with a marriage license. Yeah. So they actually did have a document stating that they were married in 1974. Wow. Yeah. So they went a long way to make it look real. Mm -hmm. And let's see, when they started living together, I think my mom was 19 and my dad was 28. This is her big brother. Well, yeah, that was um, when they got married, they had one son. He was almost two years old. So they had, uh, and then it was uh, sometime that year that their brother came over and said he uh, had some religious literature that he wanted to drop off. And uh, I guess they said they kicked him out because he wasn't willing to not be gay. Mm -hmm. So he could not join the religion. So he left that there for my mom and she uh, went through it and liked it. And she contacted a local kingdom hall and started studying. I don't think my dad really wanted to, but he went anyway. Mm -hmm. And so they, um, it came time to be baptized. So they actually um, met with the elders. You go through your questioning to, you know, see if you're qualified for baptism. And that's when my mom confessed that they were actually just brother and sister living as man and wife. And they had a... Uh, Let's see, my brother was four at the time, and my sister was a few months old. So they had these are they had two children at that time. So they went to get baptized through the Jehovah Witnesses. Is that what it is? Yes. Okay. And they told them that they were brother and sister, and they were just fine with it. No, they actually the local elders didn't know what to do, so okay. they wrote headquarters in Brooklyn, and they had to wait for a response uh -huh. to see if the couple was qualified. Okay. I mean. Under the religious guidelines, they're not. They don't allow incest. So um, so I don't really know why the local elders didn't just put it into it right there. Right. But they waited for a response, and they were approved. The um, leaders in New York said they were living in a marriage. And they approved their baptisms, and they were baptized in 1974. Mm. And it was... During that time, probably what sucked my mother in was it was the Stay Alive Till 75 recruiting campaign because mm -hmm. the world was set to end in 1975 in their beliefs. Okay. So, you know, they kind of got in in the nick of time. Yeah. You know, but, um, well, the first, so that was the first congregation we attended. And um, actually, I guess people in the congregation kind of knew. I don't know if my mom was telling other people or what. So when, when they were approved for baptism, they actually made an announcement at that congregation to accept this couple as Jehovah's family. 
So then the entire congregation knew at that point. And I mean, when the leaders make a decision, nobody can do anything about it. Mm -hmm. So I, I know people there didn't like it, but you know, if you talk against a decision, you're going to get labeled a, an apostate. So mm -hmm. you kind of had to deal with it. And then they got to watch two pregnancies back to back. They didn't have to do that before because the two were already born. Right. So I was the first child born with them as baptized Jehovah Witnesses. Okay. So I was born in 77. And then my brother was born in 78. So this congregation got to actually have to, you know, deal with looking at the pregnancies too. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was in 1982, we uh, we moved. We built a house on five acres of land, so we were we moved from that congregation. So I liked our new congregation. There's pretty nice people there. And as a Jehovah Witness, like, what are what is like the lifestyle that they live by? Because I don't know much about it. Well, in my, oh, there's no holidays. Okay. There's no Mother's Day, Father's Day, no Fourth of July. They they celebrate. They're allowed to celebrate their anniversary and the memorial of Jesus' death. Okay. Those are their only things they are allowed to celebrate. Okay. And then is there a certain like set of rules to live by for the day to day living, or not really? Well, yeah, you have to go to. Uh, Kingdom Hall meetings three days a week. Okay. And then they want you to preach. And they usually say, I think it was like 10 hours, at least 10 hours a month, you're supposed to go knock on doors. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's just to try to get more people to be a part of it. Yeah. Okay. So our, yeah, our new congregation was pretty good. And they, they didn't make an announcement at this one, so don't know how many people there knew about it mm -hmm. but so uh, we were let's see I started kindergarten in 1983 and uh, I was actually went a, a year late because my mom wanted to hold me back to make sure there's a Jehovah Witness kid in my class so yeah I was a year late and then I was really good in school too how was your relationship with your parents growing up? Like, were you close with them? Mm, I, probably not really. Um, okay. My mom was, she had some anger problems. Mm -hmm. She was uh, physically abusive okay, and emotionally abusive. Yeah, so I was never really that close to her. Did you spend more time with your siblings for the most part or more like alone? Yeah, we weren't really allowed to have friends outside yeah. of the religion. And, you know, unless you're a kid that likes the religion, and I wasn't. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't really have friends in the religion either. Yeah. So it was uh, in 1988, after a 10-year break from having kids, um, my mom had a baby boy. And he only lived three months. Wow. My last day of fourth grade, didn't know anything was wrong. Everything seemed fine. And my dad yelled out in the night that the baby wasn't breathing. I was 11 years old. And, uh, well, we lived in the country. It takes forever for an ambulance. And kind of by the time they got there, he was unresponsive for probably an hour. So... Kind of knew when he left, the, that was it. Mm -hmm. And um, turns out, uh, well, the autopsy said it was walking pneumonia. But we had no idea he was sick or mm -hmm. anything. And then it was 12 hours later, we went to my brother's graduation at the high school. Wow. So we had, we actually had food, a party planned, guests coming. So the first of us to graduate was on the same day the first of us passed away. Mm -hmm. And so people, guests were coming and being told on the spot that 
You know, this isn't just a graduation party, you know. So, yeah, that was rough because, I don't know, it's very motherly. As an 11-year-old, I liked yeah. having a baby around. And yeah, that summer, our parents kind of, they are fighting a lot. My mom already had problems with rage and anger. and So my dad ended up moving out that summer. But he'd come by to visit, but kind of came apparent that he was just stopping in to see his sister, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, he'd bring us treats and stuff, but stopping in, like, every day after work, we kind of know it wasn't for us at some point. But, yeah, I think he moved out, yeah. When I was 11, he moved out. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, he... uh Moved back in, moved out, back and forth a little bit. And within a year of, um, it wasn't even a year before that the baby died, that the f fifth baby was born. So almost right away, they were trying for a new baby. Yeah. And so that's the f fifth child. And now this... This congregation, they had a problem with that because they just watched two pregnancies back to back. Mm -hmm. And um, so the elders took my mother in the back room and they told her that this is a local decision, that they're advising that they don't have any more children, that they wouldn't make her leave her brother but there's to be no more pregnancies. Okay. So she, of course, she was pregnant with the sixth child at that point, but that, that, should, that was supposed to be it. Mm -hmm. Or she's like risking getting shunned and stuff. Right. So then he was born in 1989, and there was a problem with him. Um, apparently he did not have a properly structured urinary system and he had a dead kidney so he had to be taken two weeks early so my mother and the elders assembled a team so of doctors to make sure the baby would not be saved if he needed a blood transfusion so basically my mom put this baby up for sacrifice for the religion after we just lost a baby just one year ago, mm -hmm. and my my dad had left by that point. He left the religion, but um, he didn't stop her. He just, you know, let her make the decisions with the elders. Yeah. So he ended up living through everything. He had three surgeries. The dead kidney was removed, and and I'm assuming this was all when he was still. Yeah, born, right? under six, he had like three surgeries, be, like before he was six months old. Wow, okay. So they were ever to, able to fix everything. Mm -hmm. And then later, well, he was born with crossed eyes and they fixed that. Actually, uh, my sister that was born in 1973, she was born with crossed eyes and they, they fixed that. But other than that, none of us kids really had any serious issues mm -hmm. until the sixth baby. But it turns out that my mom wanted more babies. <laughs> she was already um, 40 years old when the sixth one was born. So my dad wasn't living there anymore. So she was just going out in the evening to his apartment for the sole purpose of having a seventh child. Mm -hmm. So, but the elders told her she couldn't do that. Right. So like I didn't, I was like um, thirteen at this time, so I didn't, I didn't, I know what she was gonna do. I thought maybe she's gonna hide the pregnancy. I didn't know what she's gonna do, but she ended up moving us to a third congregation wow. instead. So I how does that work with like leaving and going to other congregations? Is it is it based on where you're located, or you can just kind of say, I'm done with this and I'm going, I'm gonna try a different one. Yeah, you can go anywhere you okay. want, but they usually keep a record of your you know, right. misdeeds and stuff or your or how well you did knocking on doors or right. whatever. But 
I don't know what happened when we moved to our third congregation because they didn't say anything about the seventh pregnancy. Wow. So she she got away with defying the elders. Yeah. By moving to a third congregation. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, I mean, she was in good standing there. They even sent her to pioneer school. Like, you know, wow. you got to be a super Jehovah Witness for that stuff. And mm -hmm. here she is. I mean, we're watching people get shunned for smoking cigarettes, for gambling. Uh, and she's literally having babies with her brother, and they won't shun her. Because the leaders never revoked, uh, changed their decision. Yeah. So the local elders had to abide by what they what was there. Right. Because the, the elders can't even go against the leaders. Mm -hmm. So um, she had the seventh baby in 1991, and he was healthy. And um, she then, well, 42 years old, wanted to try for an eighth baby. Oh, my goodness. But her brother said no. Okay. He was done <laughs> He finally seven. said, oh, he was 52 years old. Okay. And she was 42. And he was done, or there would have been an eighth baby. So, yeah, that. So, my mother was pregnant by her brother a total of nine times, seven live births and two miscarriages. And still got to be a Jehovah Witness in good standing. That is crazy. Yeah. And um, so because we went to this third congregation, that's where, yeah, there weren't so, some very good people there. I mean, at the one before, the one we had to move from, it was pretty good. There was one man arrested for molestation, but it was for a non-Jehovah Witness child. But besides that guy, everybody was there. We went to picnics. I mean, it was nice. They mm -hmm. didn't treat us any differently because, I mean, people move con congregations. People talk, you know. Mm -hmm. I think uh, some people there knew the sibling connection. I think that's why the elders took my mother into the back. People were, they were getting stumbled. Yeah. Especially of watching the pregnancies back to back mm -hmm. like that. And were you in school at this time, like just pu regular public school? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, but I wouldn't be for long because um, there came a time where at our third congregation, all the Jehovah Witnesses there were pulling their kids out to homeschool them. And even though I was, I was a straight A student, I was taken out of school. So... My education was ended at, uh, I got to finish seventh grade. Okay. And uh, my mother wasn't capable of teaching me at home. She right. didn't, I mean, I was already an accelerated reader, writer. There was, there's nothing she could teach me. So I basically just sat at home. And, and there was no rules about that? Like she didn't have to um, submit like any type of work that you were doing or anything? I don't. I don't know which program she okay. was using, but yeah, she had to show that I was doing something. And like, like for social studies, she would tell me to read the Watchtower, which is the religious propaganda, mm -hmm. um, like just all these shortcuts like that. Right. Like, but so I didn't. Yeah, I didn't get any education after seventh grade, and she pulled my. Uh, brother out too so his my closest in age sibling his education ended at sixth grade mm. and that was it we were just done with school yeah the older two uh did get to graduate okay were you so, upset about that when they pulled you out oh my goodness i was grieving my education yeah because by that time it's you know i was a seventh grade i was about 13 because mm -hmm. I went a year late yeah I was because I was a straight-a student I loved school and um, I did all the book reading contest and won them all mm -hmm. and the old Pizza Hut programs uh, yeah. where you get a free pizza and reading all these books and um, yeah and then by that time being about 13 I had no interest in the religion 
So the only friends I had were was at school. Mm-hmm. So now I'm home 24-7. Right. So basically I'm just at home uh, taking care of the babies. And that's about it because... <laughs> yeah. Was your mom working <clears throat> at all? No. Okay. And um, like if a kid from school would be riding their bike and come to the door, we'd be just be told, well... Yes, you can open the door and say hi, but send them on their way, you know. So I would be enforced only to have Jehovah Witness friends. But at a point, they don't want to be my friend. Yeah. I'm not working towards baptism. I'm okay. a teenager who does not believe in any of it, and I'm not working towards baptism. So some of their, you know, their parents don't want them to hang around me. Right. So I have no girls my age to talk to at that point. Luckily, I I have a sister because there's five boys and two girls. So I had a sister, Mm -hmm. but I had no girls my age to be my friend at that point. And um, it's just, uh, yeah, if you're not working towards baptism, then they kind of write you off. But this third congregation, though, had people from our original congregation that had transferred there. So they knew who you guys were. They heard the announcement. So there was a couple families that no way, no how, were they letting their children, of course, in our home, but not alone to be a friend to me. I mean, I don't blame them, you know, (laughs) because, I mean, there's a brother and a sister doing this in the house. You don't know what else going in the house. And I mean, I don't blame them for that. But that, that was actually the first time I ever got to feel judged for, you know, for it. Right. And I was going to ask you, too, at what age do you feel like you realized, okay, this isn't right or this isn't how it normally is in families? I mean, it just, when it's all you've known, mm-hmm. it's just, I never, like, ever thought it out as a kid like this is disgusting or you know I just knew uh, you know at the third congregation and because the elders took my mom in the back that people thought it was disgusting you know or they wouldn't have you know said hey this needs to stop but then at the uh, well because we had to move to that one so my mom could get another baby in um, that's where I met a man when I was 13, he was 21, and because, well, I'm sitting at home, taking care of babies, I have no education, my mother is very physically abusive, I mean, she's punching, hitting, you know, very violent woman, and so I'm just lonely, depressed, don't have any friends, <laughs> can't have any friends. So um, this guy at the Kingdom Hall, he's baptized. He took interest in me, even though he's like a 21-year-old man. And me, because I'm pretty much, I you know, I felt I was grown in my head anyway because I'm already taking care of babies right. all day, you know. So um, I kind of soaked it all in. This guy wanted my attention. He liked me, uh, you know. I, at that time, didn't see nothing wrong with it. And um, we'd, uh, they had this, uh, there was a Jehovah Witness family that owned a roller rink. So we had, on Sundays, we had Jehovah Witness skate night. So I'd, I'd meet him there, and we'd couple skate in front of everybody. Nobody said anything there, you know, like, that it was wrong or anything and even the owner was a Jehovah Witness and she walked up on him and she he had his hand in my pants I'm a kid he's a man and she didn't kick him out she said uh you guys don't need to be sitting back here by yourself didn't kick him out didn't report him didn't call the police so like and he even came to my house one night when my mom wasn't there and was in my bedroom. And my oldest brother, who was also 21 years old, all he said was, 
leave the door open. My brother, my oldest brother's a very, he was very indoctrinated. So, like, no alarms go off with him because this man's a baptized Jehovah Witness. Mm -hmm. He's in your kid sister's room, and you're still not doing anything, you know. And I guess at a certain point, somebody, I don't know who it was, people started, somebody started talking, I don't know who it was, but um, he ended up getting uh, called back to the elders, Is that what they call a judicial hearing, so they can see if he needs to be shunned. I don't know what he said, but he didn't get shunned, they didn't call the police, they didn't do anything. Um... They didn't even do the minimum. They didn't question me. Right. I wasn't baptized, you know, so I don't really count as a witness because I'm not baptized. So my word's kind of yeah. so not so good. So do you think so if you were baptized and they would have maybe questioned you? Yeah, probably. Okay. Probably they would have. But they didn't even question the adult Jehovah Witness, my brother, living in the home. They, right. like, questioned nobody. So I don't know what the man said back there. Probably like, she's got a crush on me. That's it. Nothing happened kind yeah. of thing. But me, in my mind, I thought he was my boyfriend. So I was happy they didn't punish him. Right. Like, I didn't, I mean, I'm living in a house with this brother and sister doing whatever. And my mom was very inappropriate in her language and wanting us to look at her body so I didn't think none of it. I thought this man was my boyfriend. So I was kind of happy the elders didn't do what they were supposed to do and didn't have him arrested or anything. So because they didn't do that, I got to be with him longer, which now sounds pretty messed up, you know. But I'm, you know, I didn't have anybody. Yeah. So. I could tell him all my secrets. He's not going to tell, you know. Right. He's gonna, if he tells all these deep, dark secrets, they're going to know he's spending too much time with me. So, you know, he kind of has to keep my secrets, you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, they just, they didn't question anybody about it. Wow. Yeah, I don't. So, there come a time in a... Uh, when I was 15, I started getting just really fed up, just at home, watching babies, no education. My mom, her rage is terrible. We didn't, like, you don't even know what you could say or do. It's just, she's just going to go well, like nuts, set her off. you yeah. know. And um, so then I got, so I got kind of like, you know, I got an abuser at the Kingdom Hall, which I don't kind of process that he's not good then I got my mom at home and I was just tired of being hit tired of being scared of her and so it was um, early February 1993 um, I don't know one day I just decided I'm not going to be here anymore one way or another just one day, just, uh, so I decided one night either I'm running away or I'm going to take my life. And didn't know which because, I mean, I got a bunch of siblings and I love them a lot. You know, that's the only love I had was my siblings. Um, so I, I didn't know what to do. My mom was at night classes. So I called my dad, he lived about four miles away. And I told him I was crying and crying and I said, I can't, I can't be hit anymore. I need to get out of here. I said, I asked him if I could come live with him. It's only lives like four miles away. And he told me that, uh, he didn't want to get in the middle of things and that I could just deal with it for two more years and then get the hell out of there. Those were his exact words. That's what, that was his advice to me. And I, I even said, I'm running away or I'm dying tonight because I'm not doing this. 
And he still, that was his advice to me. He didn't want to get in the middle of things. So I just got tired of hearing his voice and hung up on him. And he didn't come over to check on me. So by 10, 10 that evening, I was gone. <laughs> I uh, actually, nine days before my 16th birthday, I left home. And I left with a brother from another congregation because that's who I called after my, after I talked to my dad and there was he wasn't going to do anything. So um, I kind of, when I was 14, started seeing a guy at another congregation. As I was seeing the adult man too, when that guy, when the guy closer to my age came into my life, I was still seeing the adult guy too. And then, um, so, so I, I'd say the, this guy was my, the one that I called next was my boyfriend. And, uh, he's re he was really shy. I couldn't believe it on the phone. I was, I was so upset because I like, I felt my dad just like said, I don't care if you live or die. Right. And so I, um. Actually, uh, I was surprised when he said that he was coming to get me. I'm like, what do you mean you're coming to get me? He's baptized. He's, mm -hmm. you can't come get me. You're going to get shunned. You, you know, you know. And it just happened all that fast from my dad to calling him. Just like in an hour's time, there was a plan to run away with my boyfriend, yeah. I didn't even have no clue that he, because he was going to risk shunning an arrest. Right. And could he, did he have his license and like a car and everything to drive? Yeah, he had a job okay. and he had his, you know, own money and stuff. So he actually pulled in the driveway with the headlights out because my siblings were in the house. Was your mom home? No, she was at night school. Okay. And, uh. Well, my my baby brothers were only uh, was almost two and three years old at that time, so like that was that was hard on me because I can't take them, you know. So I'm holding them in my arms. Yeah. He probably went out and crying, and I'm like, I don't want to leave them because I know they're gonna get abused, but I I couldn't stay, right? Because even though I was you know thinking suicidal things. I didn't want to die. I ha if I stayed, I'm gonna die because I can't do it. And uh, so yeah, I, ha I had to leave the babies. Yeah, and that's all I that's all I was doing. I was uh, it was I ran away nine days for my sixteenth okay. birthday, but that was all I was doing though at home because I had no education, no friends. All I was doing is taking care of those babies. Right. So that's that was like hard to leave them so we ended up uh me and the boyfriend ended up um just driving we didn't really have a plan he just he didn't want me to be hurt anymore was so. he planning on leaving his family as well or he was just trying to get you out of your situation no he he loved his family okay and he just couldn't stand what was happening to me yeah and so yeah, it's kind of like weird because <laughs> I'm kind of, so this shy Jehovah Witness boy just says, hey, I, I can't watch this. You have to get out of there and I'm willing to take all these risks to do it. You can't stay there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we ended up just traveling. We went through West Virginia. We stayed in South Carolina for a while. So I had my 16th birthday as a runaway, which <clears throat> it really wasn't really a big deal because I never had a birthday before. So, because <laughs> I was born into the Jehovah Witnesses. Mm -hmm. So I never had anyone tell me happy birthday or nothing like that. So my 16th birthday on the run wasn't really uh, spectacular or anything. But thing is, me and him had never been alone together. Because you're not supposed to as Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. So I went from him being my 
boyfriend to never being alone together, then suddenly we're on the run and technically living out of hotels, like that quick. Right. <laughs> yeah. So that was definitely an experience. And I don't know, he, he, is, he did have the, he's baptized, had the Jehovah Witness mindset. So he did want to get married. Even though I'm 16, he was 18. And uh, so we decided, I, I mean, I don't know. Well, my options were I can't be on the run for two years until I'm 18 to stay away from my mother. Um, so I did agree to marry him, but we had to sneak back into Ohio so I could pick up my birth certificate and ID to get married. And um, he, uh, so we actually... His parents, Jehovah Witness parents, which are devout, devout Jehovah Witnesses, hid me out in their home for two weeks as a runaway, risking shunning. Wow. Um, yeah, it's all kind of weird because these Jehovah Witnesses hide me from other Jehovah Witnesses. Mm -hmm. um, but they, his parents eventually found out that, um, obviously, they made the connection, hey, she's missing, he's missing, uh, we're together. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so they went, his parents went over and actually met my mother for the first time. And she had that bad of a first impression on them that they were willing to risk everything too so I wouldn't go back. And uh, they said when uh, they went over there, they were talking to her about, you know, how are we going to find them? That Nobody knew where we were. And uh, they said she just acted like she she didn't care like she didn't love you at all she was just mad she wasn't worried you were kind of mad that you embarrassed her not worried that are you safe or you know you and got probably food. mad too that you weren't there to help with the babies I'm sure yeah my my sister was still there she okay. me and her being the only two girls too mm -hmm. we took care of a lot of things cleaning taking care of the babies um so, and also, I guess when they were there, they said that um, my brother that was almost two, he was, uh, it was, it was winter time. He was laying on a concrete floor just in a diaper. And she said, uh, she asked, his mother asked my mom, aren't you going to cover him up? She's like, he's fine. She was shocked that you'd let a baby lay on a cold floor, you know. So that was their impression of meeting my mother for the first time. So, yeah, they were willing to hide me out in their home. Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't like it. I'm sure right. they were scared of consequences, but that's... They wanted to help. That's how bad my mother's first impression is, probably on most people, but <laughs> that's what they did. So... I end up being able to get married. Actually, I was married almost a little over two months after running away. So I was just 16 years old and a wife <laughs> and pregnant. <laughs> wow, really? Yeah. All within the span of two months? Just over two months, okay. yeah. So. And were you living with him and his parents at this time? We had... Uh, after I came back into town and got my ID and all that stuff, we kind of ran off again okay. and we got married. And because I was, well, once I found out I was pregnant, I didn't need permission for marriage. Okay. Because we were staying out in South Carolina and Georgia. Mm -hmm. But we were consistently staying at usually the same hotel in South Carolina. And there was like, there's uh, this, the manager there was like a Southern woman. She was like in her fifties. And at some point I trusted her enough to, cause she kind of suspected I was a runaway. At some point I trusted her enough to tell her the truth. And which was really cool. Cause I kind of like, I'm on the run from my mother, but mm -hmm. for these few weeks in South Carolina, I, I had a mother kind of right for the first time. So that was cool. And um, she, because um, then I found out I was pregnant, and she, she's the one that said, you know, if you go over to Georgia, you don't need your parents' permission. 
if if you're pregnant. So yeah, that's how the plan to get married happened. Was <laughs> this southern woman so much didn't want me to go back home? She'd rather see me married as a teenager than go back home. So yeah, it's weird because I I had his mom. I had this stranger practically I met that became like my mom and they're both you know helping me not go back to my real mom mm -hmm. so yeah it was uh I had my, my first kid at 16 and was that in Georgia no we I, actually oh yeah we came back to Ohio okay. after you know I felt I was legally married and couldn't be arrested mm -hmm. for runaway but I was only back a few days and was arrested. <laughs> I was arrested at 16 for runaway because the courts had to determine if I was legally married. Okay. And so we went into a court hearing. I only had to um, stay in custody overnight, and then there was the court hearing. And um, so, you know, I had the whole getup on. I had the shackles on on my feet and cuffs cuffed in the front just for running away so I was brought through the courthouse like that so um, we pass a bench where my parents were sitting for the hearing and my mother just looks at me really cold and my dad was actually chuckling I thought it the whole chain system was funny like I haven't I hadn't set eyes on them in like over two months and that's what I get, you know. They yeah. finally see their daughter. She's you're safe. She's safe and sound, and that's what I get. And I'm just like, wow. I guess I mean I might be a pregnant teenager, but I mean I didn't have any options. But I'm right. I'm glad I'm away from them. And so the court staff was really awesome. They um, asked me to write out reasons I shouldn't go back home and all that and well I had a whole long list and luckily you know I'm an accelerated writer reader uh had no problem doing that and uh the judge uh emancipated me he said my marriage was legal and I was emancipated by the state of Ohio at age 16 and then they ordered for me, I could go pick up my stuff, my clothing and stuff at my mother's. So my new husband drove me there. And well, the first thing my mom does is, you know, make fun of, cause I gained a few pounds Well, I'm pregnant. Um, so that's the first thing she does, not hug, not I miss you, not any of that. So I go out and get my stuff and I really try not to have any conversation with her at that point. And she she really was just kind of standing there. She didn't really try to say much to me either. And then I was about ready to get back in the car. Oh, my husband stayed in the car. And I went in by myself. And I was about ready to get in the car. And she started screaming from the doorway finally she wants to engage in something and she started screaming i love you i love you i love you over and over like a crazy woman she's like is that what you wanted that's what yeah and my husband had never seen that that part of her he was in shock Especially because it's a devout Jehovah Witness woman, and he's a baptized Jehovah Witness. Mm -hmm. Couldn't believe, because you know he had been over to the house, you know, before, right? And no, never was she like that. So, my mother was mocking me because I wanted to be loved by my mother, and that that happened to my sister before too. Like we were watching a TV show, and my sister's like, "Why can't our?" family be like that one or something and my mom started being she was like oh is that what you want and it's like we got mocked for wanting to be loved you know yeah 
So yeah, that, I mean, it wasn't surprising to me, you know, that she had to do all that. A little surprising that she did it in front of another Jehovah Witness, though, mm-hmm. but. Yeah. Because she tried to keep a lot of it under wraps, do you think? Like, do you think in front of, um, like, when you were, so with the congregation, is it kind of like a community that you guys, that, like, everybody would meet up type of thing? Well, I mean, you go you go to the kingdom hall three days a week. Okay, so when. And then most of your activities outside of that, you know, like. My brother used to, like, rent uh, high school gyms, and then you'd have Jehovah Witness basketball night. So do you think in front of other people, your mom kind of tried to put on a front like she was this great mother? Or do you think she was pretty much always the same way? I think she was so mentally unstable that she couldn't consistently okay. act a certain like she's yeah. expected to act. Okay. Like, uh, we had this one brother over, uh, um, brother as in Jehovah Witness brother mm-hmm. over, and he was about 18 years old, and he got the shock of his life to see what she, what she was like. Um, she was actually, uh, I think, breastfeeding at the time. She uh, she pulled it out and started squirting him with her breast milk. Your mom was squirting the, the boy? He, oh, he was like 18 years old. Started squirting another Jehovah Witness with her breast milk in her house. Like, so she didn't have, she yeah. couldn't think, like, you know, this is wrong. She just right. did, did things in the, and, you know, you're exposing your breast to a baptized Jehovah Witness. And, and squirting him with your breast milk. Yeah, and he, he didn't even, um, I don't think he reported her, but I'm sure he told others in the congregation, hey, you know, there's something, something wrong with her. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you think that the Jehovah Witnesses cover up a lot of stuff, would you say? Well, I mean, with my family, they right. did. I mean, that. Or just like brushed it under the rug? Well, actually, um, we had. Oh, it was my 13 year old brother did go to the elders at our third congregation about the abuse. And um, he was 13. I don't know if there was two or three elders. Um, he wanted to talk to the elders about being abused at home. But the elders let my mother sit in on it. So my brother's then forced to tell about the abuse right in front of his abuser. Right. And so I wasn't in that, that meeting, but... When my brother came out, he was not happy because he said he felt like they were laughing at him because our mother was already bigger than, I mean, he was already bigger than our mother because he was a pretty tall boy. So he's 13, talking about years of child abuse, and he felt they were laughing him off because our mother's like 5'1 and, you know, a smaller woman. And thing is right then they didn't question the baptized adult brother that was in the house they didn't question any of us other children about any abuse they just dropped it so we were on the way home that night from the kingdom hall and I thought my brother was gonna get it because he just spilled it all I mean, he's brave. He did it right in front of her because they didn't give him another choice. But um, my mom wasn't mad. She, like, glowed all the way home. She was in a great mood when we got home. The elders didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. She knew they blew him off right there. She was in the room with them. So she was actually in a great mood. So then we thought, "Uh uh-oh, what did he do? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, he did actually try to help us going to the elders. So they did, they brushed off the relationship yeah. I had with that grown right. man there. And then they brushed off my brother, same congregation elders too, brushed off my brother when he said child abuse. But there was a, I mean, they knew because at one time I, I came into the Kingdom Hall, I was, I was probably 14. My face was all red. 
And these two brothers there come up and they're like, what happened to you or what's wrong with you? I said, well, just like a half hour before we left our house, my mom just went to town on my face, slapping and slapping, and they saw my face was still red. And they didn't even act surprised. Like, yeah, yeah, you're two grown men standing here asking me why my face is red. And then um, there's a couple, there were a couple like elderly brothers there. They used to low key check on us, you know, like, so they, I mean, they knew the abuse was happening. They would be like, oh, how are you guys? Oh, how's your mother treating you? And one time, uh, one of them told my brother, um, well, we know, we know your mom has temper tantrums. Temper tantrums. That's what they call child abuse, temper tantrums. <laughs> so, I mean, they knew. Yeah. They knew about the abuse. But usually when the congregation, a majority of the congregation, even uh, too many people know about something, that person will get shunned. And she never did? No. She didn't. Um, so, yeah, my brother was upset that they, he thought the men were laughing at him because, oh, yeah, how's this little woman going to abuse you? Mm-hmm. But none of us ever hit her back, you know? Right. My sister tried to hit, to hit her back once, and my mom tried to break her fingers. We didn't hit her back. She hit my oldest brother till he was a grown man. He was like 20, I think, the last time he got punched in the face. So, I mean, we don't, we never hit her back. We just took it. I mean, we figured we'd be the one in trouble too, the way she operated things, you know. But, so yeah, that was my, my closest in age sibling. That was um my brother he uh so yeah he's the one that reported that and then he when he was uh 17 he actually he did he did have a suicide attempt when he was 17 and i don't know the congregation just let him slip through the cracks and he uh made it through that attempt with no permanent damage, I guess he, he took a bunch of pills or something, and instead, well, he didn't get any mental health care, and he didn't get no care from the congregation, so my mother decided to put a life insurance policy on him, didn't put him in counseling, so he was... He was dead by 19. So that's my my second brother. So three weeks before I turned 21, my brother left our t- small town. In passing, he said something to somebody that he was done living. Well, this is a funny guy. He's a jokester. He did stunt comedy. Like, he did everything, you know, to make people laugh. So I don't think that person thought, hey, this guy's serious. Yeah. You know, like, he would, like, you know, when he even when he came to my house, he would, like, you know, fall into my house like Kramer on Seinfeld. Mm-hmm. Like, he did all this stunt stuff. And, right. You know, so, you know, probably he's always wanted to make people laugh, you know. So I don't think so. It wasn't even two hours after he said that he was pronounced dead. He um, got on the highway and what appeared to be making deliberate attempts to get semis to crash into a sports car. And that caught, obviously caught the attention of state troopers, police. So a high-speed ch- police chase started and it was 120 miles an hour. And he was coming up to an exit and I guess he took out he took out some guard rail, rails at that exit, 120 miles an hour, and his when he was in a Camaro, it went uh, airborne into a steel utility pole, and he he died instantly, and the impact was just so severe that 
it unearths the actual pole from the ground that weighed thousands of pounds and that pole came down on his car as well but he was dead by the time it crashed onto yeah. his car and um and he didn't have no reason to run from the police he no criminal record no drugs none of us ever did drugs or drank um the only thing was what he said to someone two hours before that was he was 19 years old and done living so his death was aired on World's Scariest Police Chases for entertainment purposes. Because mm. they kind of don't tell you at the end, uh, you know. Like the, the person was, yeah, yeah, the person was 19 and on a suicide mission. Right. So, yeah, he, after all that, he just, I don't know, I guess he became an adult and could process the past. But, you know, I was never, you know, mad about him, about it, you know. Like, I understand. I mean, I came where he, from where he did, you know. But that was, um, so not only did he speak out about the abuse when he was 13 to the elders, but he spoke out when he was, I think it was nine years old, to the, to the, um, our other congregation. Mm -hmm. Um. Because, well, because you're a Jehovah Witness, you generally let your guard down around other Jehovah Witnesses. So my mom was letting him go visit this elderly man in the congregation. And uh, my brother was like, oh, after a few times over there, he's like, I'm getting really irritated. Every time I go in the bathroom to pee, the guys in the mirror act like he's washing his hands, fixing his hair, and all this stuff. And... My brother's nine, and he's I don't think I want to go over there anymore. It's too weird, because he's alone in this man's house. This man, he got to be at least 70. Mm -hmm. So an old man, old Jehovah Witness man, you know, my mom didn't think nothing about letting him go over there to keep the guy company. And it was a few weeks later, that man was arrested. For, uh, it wasn't a Jehovah Witness child, but it was a, one of his family members, a l little girl, for molesting her. So, yeah, my brother, he spoke out a couple of times against yeah. things that were wrong, but in the end, he just couldn't, couldn't go on. So. Yeah. And how was your relationship with your siblings after you had moved out and got pregnant? Did you stay in contact with them, or was it kind of hard? Well, I was always uh, close to my sister, so okay. we um, we didn't have, uh, I mean, of course, I didn't see her as much because I'd have to go over to my mom's house to do it because she was, right. when I ran away, uh, I was almost 16. She was 19, but still living in the house, and... Um, so I didn't get to see her as much. But I did actually go over there sometimes just, you know, to see my siblings because, you know, the babies were so young, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and well, one time when I was over there visiting, I think I had two kids by that time. Well, I had, I had two kids by the time I was 18 three by the time I was 20. Um, but I think that at that time I had uh, the two kids, so I was like 18 years old with two kids. And I was over there visiting, and my mom, she went into one of her little rages, She and she she raised her hand to hit me. After I've been out of the house, I'm a married woman with two kids. She raised her hand to hit me, and she she stopped. I don't know. I don't know why she stopped. She never did before. But maybe because she thought I would hit her back. Maybe that was the first time she thought I'd hit her back. So I had actually gotten a ride there because I didn't have a license for a while. I didn't even get a license until I had two kids. Um, but uh, I actually called my dad 
to come pick me up, take me home. I waited outside with my children. Because I'm like, she just, she wants to hit me. I'm like, I'm leaving. So yeah, even after I ran away, came in, it's, it's so in her. Yeah. To, she raised her hand, she was going to hit me. It's like, no, you, you ain't doing that. I, I am leaving. I did she wait outside a, in the yard. Did she have a relationship with your children at all? Not a whole lot. Like, do you think she cared that you had kids or she just didn't have that kind of motherly instinct? She, uh, yeah, she wasn't that motherly. I honestly don't know why she wanted so many children. Yeah. There came a point where I thought the whole thing just became a little like a fetish to her, mm -hmm. <laughs> if I would say that. Because, um, like, she liked talking about her love for her brother. She didn't have to even tell the elders that. She didn't have to tell anybody that. She wanted to tell people that. Yeah, like she didn't want to keep it a secret. Yeah, like she told my sister when my sister was in kindergarten. Like, why? Yeah. And then after knowing that everybody's disgusted at the kingdom hall because you keep coming in pregnant, you go and want to do it even more, enough to move to another congregation, you know? Right. Like, she knew that people thought she was dis what she was doing was disgusting, and she still she wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it just, like, yeah, by the time I was, probably by the time I was about fourth grade, I knew how my dad performed in bed. I knew what kind of size he was. My mother liked talking about what she did with her brother, even to children. So, to, I don't know. I think, initially, I think she, she got with him out of, because she wanted to escape her abuse at home. Then at some point, they were both really possessive of one another, you know. They were both kind of controlling of one another. Like, if, uh, like a time they were, they were separated for a long time. Um, and like my dad went out with uh, other women and my mom would find those women and say, you know what? He's, he slept with his sister for all these years. She would confess to strange women she never met to keep them away from her brother. <laughs> yeah, so. Oh my gosh. But actually my mother, uh, they actually got, uh, well, we're gonna call it divorced in mm -hmm. 1998 because they, you know, they frauded the court to get the marriage license. So they had to use, then use the court to get a fake divorce. Mm -hmm. So in 1998, they used the court to get that fake divorce because, of course, the divorce court, the court don't know it wasn't a valid marriage. Mm -hmm. So they actually went through a whole divorce hearings and stuff. And um, so then the 30-year uh, lie was over. But I guess it's never over, though, because they don't call each other brother and sister like, they still pretend they're ex-husband and ex-wife. Yeah. But, yeah, my mom never married anyone. I don't even think she dated anyone after him. Were they the only two siblings in there from their parents? No, there was ten of them. Wow. So she came from a big family, too. Yeah. Did her siblings have any say or, like, have anything to say about them being together? And having kids together, or you don't know? Oh, I know her Her one sister was very, very embarrassed. Okay. And her, uh, she, she had a younger brother that was, uh, he was, yeah, he was talking a little bit. He was pretty upset. And the parents, were they around? 
Your parents? So your grandparents? My my dad's father never met him. Okay. Um. His his mother, he was the firstborn, so he's almost ten years older mm-hmm. than my mom, but um. His father was my grandma's cousin. So my dad's parents are cousins. Mm -hmm. And then she kind of got ashamed about that. And they actually filed for a marriage certificate, but my grandma couldn't get her cousin to marry her. So uh, she was ended up, you know, as a single mother Mm -hmm. in single mother in 1940. So, yeah, she uh, had to hurry up and find another husband, a husband. And so she she married a guy in 1941, and that man adopted my father. And then, I think it was 19, 1946, she divorced that man, but she had uh, she had four kids with him. And then, see, and she was divorced again. Um, those five children, including my dad, got sent to an orphanage. Mm-hmm. And she just never came back for them. She just went and she got another husband. So my mom came from that. Right. That relationship. Um, but, yeah, they saw each other growing up and everything. But my dad was raised with his grandfather, and my mom was raised with their mother. Okay. So, yeah, they always knew they were siblings. But, yeah, I think a couple of the siblings, uh, like, my dad hadn't talked to them in over 30 years, and that's probably why. Mm-hmm. <laughs> probably why they weren't accepting it in a way. Right. But, yeah. I mean, we had uh, cousins at the Kingdom Hall, too. And... um they just seemed to kind of accept it. They were um, my mom's cousin who had like four kids. They were at the Kingdom Hall with us and we went over to their house. They didn't, you know, say any, I mean, mm-hmm. they didn't treat us any differently because obviously they're family. They know yeah. <laughs> that this is brother and sister. Um, but yeah, I think... My grandma was happy her children were in love. She was, a, but you know, that's, my mom comes from that. Her mother right. was very, very unstable. So I think, I mean, after all that my mother did, I think a lot of people would think, oh, you must hate her. It's like, no. She actually was a victim. She started out that way. Yeah. I don't know how she could ever have healed from what she went through as a child. And... Is she still around? Yeah. I think her her big brother took advantage of her. That's what I think. I think my dad took a victim of abuse and used it because my mom said her big brother touched her since she was nine years like nine years old and stuff so her big brother instead of you know coming to save her getting her started in life he he made a wife out of her but she seemed to you know but she was groomed for years to be his wife you know yeah so I, I can't hate her, for, even though, I mean, she caused me a lot of harm. I, I feel my brother ended his life partly because of the things she's done to us. But I can still, you know, see her as the victim, you know. Yeah. It's like my dad was not a violent man to her or to us. But to me, he's the worst person in my story. You don't take 
you know, a victim of child abuse. You know, especially your own sister. Mm-hmm. And basically turn her into your wife. Yeah. And then let her spin out of control. And like he didn't say, he knew we were being abused by her, didn't right. say nothing. Well, it also he just knew like it doesn't break the cycle. It allows that cycle to keep yeah. going down and down. And then he knew she wasn't mentally stable. He let her join a doomsday cult. And then they watched her flip around and, you know, you know, I actually feel bad for my mom that nobody stepped in to yeah. say, hey, do you need help, you know? Do you guys have a relationship today? The only one that sees her is my oldest brother. Okay. The rest of us, um, she just, I don't know. It's sad. That's, that's the way it played out, but, you know. She's not, I have children and grandchildren, and she's, I don't feel safe to be around. Yeah. But I think that makes sense because, you know, I think that you can view your mother the way that you want to, and you don't have to hate her, and you can see that she's a, you know, was a victim of abuse as well. Um, But I also think that you're taking that step like I just mentioned, to not let this be a cycle and to keep your children safe from experiencing, you know, the any type of abuse that you experienced, you know? Yeah, th- I mean, they have they have met her in their mm-hmm. lives, but, well, all my, my children are all adults. Uh, yeah. They don't want any connection. And, and uh, they know about everything. Yeah. And uh, my, well, their other... Their other, my children's other grandmother is still a Jehovah Witness. They, you know, they're, they love that, you know, they love that grandma and they're close to her. But my mom, you know, she's basically. Is she still a Jehovah Witness? She's a Jehovah Witness in good standing. And she went back to her original congregation, the one who started the whole thing and approved the whole brother-sister thing. Wow. Yeah, she's 74 years old and still claims to be a devout Jehovah Witness. My dad only went was in about 11 years mm-hmm. and then it's it's just too much it's too much of a schedule for a, you know, a man that's got a hard job and so many kids and you know, you get home from work and you got to Tuesday, Thursday be at a kingdom hall. Yeah. You day off Sunday at the kingdom hall knocking on doors on a Saturday. A guy that, you know, got a physical job and six, seven kids, he, he, could, he couldn't keep up with it, you know. He doesn't talk against the religion or anything, but, yeah, it's just... But yeah, all of us children left the religion. I obviously was never baptized. Mm-hmm. Only two of us were. Okay. My oldest brother and the one that died in the police chase, he was baptized. The rest of us, we actually just never accepted it at all Do from you a think- young age. But, you know, I, I just find it that, you know, they were still trying as a teenager to get me baptized. Yeah. Like, really weird, you know. It's really weird to ask me as a teenager to get baptized when you just let me be with this older man for longer. You... No, I know your frauds. You can't be the true religion when, when, you know, you're letting my family there, you know. So, I mean, they're still trying to get me baptized knowing I know they're frauds, you know. Yeah. You, why would you do that? But why? Because once you're baptized, that's how they control you. Yeah. Well, if you do this, you can be shunned. You do this, you, you know. Do you think that your brother passing away, do you think that had an effect on your mom at all? I don't know. She was bragging about the $10,000 she got from the wreck. She had put that life insurance policy on him at, at 17. Right. I mean, I imagine, yeah. I, I imagine no matter how 
bad or unstable, you're, you've got I think you've got to feel something. Yeah. But in my last conversation with my brother was about three weeks before he died, and he said, "Mom wants me dead." I'm like, "What are you talking about?" And then I couldn't even say she don't. Because I knew she, she did that. She put life insurance, or she put life insurance on her dad and talked to us all the time about, oh, if your dad dies in an accident, I'll get double the money. Oh, no, oh, I could move to this state. Uh, she'd look up these fantasy houses where, you know, if her dad would just die already, she could get this house. Uh, she paid on his life insurance for years after they split up, but, you know, he's an 83 year old man and uh, she got tired of waiting so yeah. she quit paying on him but yeah I mean that's that's really the last conversation I had with him mom wants me dead he was talking about the life insurance and I told him don't don't give her that you know don't I mean he didn't but he never really did appear depressed because he was so funny right. you know so, you know, I was almost 21 when that happened. I have no, I mean, I can't, I mean, yeah, I can look back and say, oh, I should have said this to him, I should have said that to him. I, but when somebody's such a comedian and you can't see the pain, you know, mm -hmm. you just can't see it. I realized when I, got a little older, I actually did end up, like, what our, what our parents actually taught us, though, was no drugs, no alcohol. We didn't have that in our home, never. No drugs, no alcohol. So if none of us children ever, you know, did any of that to deal with any of this. And, and I actually, I think I am the only one that did end up with an addiction. When you're a teenage girl, in a religion, watching people, like, they're just, they're sexually repressed, they're grieving for sex, like, it's sad, I guess, and because what happened with me and the older man, and maybe because my mother was so filthy talking to me when I was so young, I just... I don't know. I, I was a virgin when I left home, married the first man I was ever with. And I ended up with a sex addiction. I guess a lot of people coming out of that cult end up repressed or probably like me, not knowing what to do about sex at all. So yeah, it was... You're told it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. And yeah, I don't know. But I think it was over 20 years of fighting that. And I didn't, you know, realize till like maybe even recently that. I was actually, that I had my mother's rage. I didn't know I did. Like she raged at everybody because of her childhood pain. And I was, I was using sex to not feel my rage. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't heal. I could not heal, I kept, making bad decisions, like, I didn't even know I was that furious, you know. And I had to feel something, something strong. And so, that's what I did. I used, I was, actually, so I was married at 16. By 17, I was addicted to sex. And that was... Marrying, and I married a repressed Jehovah Witness guy. Mm -hmm. So, and that's rough, you know. When you, <laughs> so I had to feel something. 
something strong. I didn't want to be like my mother and hit people and punch things and, you know. So I rep replaced, instead of feeling the rage, I was just feeling other strong things. I didn't know why I was doing it for over 20 years. That was that was my rage. Mm -hmm. Every time I was doing something sexual that was risky, that was this or that, uh, that was my rage. I didn't even know it. But yeah, it's only been the last, probably the last five years that I actually like who I am. My Kids had to see this just ugly healing, ugly mess, ugliness when I wasn't even knowing I had to heal. I thought because, you know, well, I don't hate all Jehovah Witnesses. I don't hate my mother. Well, I'm healed. Well, yeah, I wasn't. Right. <laughs> not hating is not being healed. So when I gave up, like fought and gave up, like being addicted to sex, then... I had to feel everything. And get through it. Yeah. I had to feel all that. I had to, I had to, at least for a time, I had to hate them for, you know, hate my parents, hate the Jehovah Witnesses for, especially for my brother being gone and it took his own life. Like that, I really hated them for that. But I, I know even if we didn't become Jehovah Witnesses, we would not have had an easy life. It just complicated it because now we got this whole new set of people that expect so much from us. You know, like at home, we, we can't uh, do anything right because our mother just out of nowhere do something violent. And then we're you know, at a kingdom hall where you're expected to do everything right, you know. And actually, at least probably three of us have a pretty bad OCD <laughs> to this day. Probably because something to do with that, I guess. Just you can't like uh, like we never know when our mother would, you know. Like one day, my sister did the laundry wrong, so my mother folded up some wire coat hangers and whipped her legs and she had welts all down her legs and and I think she called my dad or my dad had just, just happened to be coming over. She we ran out to the road and he inspected her legs and he said he's like, Your mother needs to be in an institution right now and then then he just left. Mm -hmm. You know? It's like how do you do that? But um couple um, stories about my brother who died in the police chase. A couple things he was probably messed him up pretty bad was well, when he was nine, my, um, my mother wanted a new house. So she sent him up into the attic with matches and newspapers. And I guess she, he, he thought she, she was playing a game, and he liked it. Mom said, I can go up in the attic and make fires. So she sent him up there by himself to do it. And um, but the reason she, she picked him was because my sister was 14 and told her no. She actually asked my sister to do it. Maybe because she thought she maybe wouldn't get hurt or something, but... When my sister said no, she sent my little brother up there, and he did. He sent fires. <clears throat> and when the fire department came, that was in 1987, I believe, um, the fire department came, she just said her son was playing with matches in the attic. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so she, she basically 
had her nine-year-old son commit arson because she wanted a new house. Now, he didn't do a very good job, I guess. Um, so, kind of like the, it damaged the attic a little bit. Mm -hmm. but it, And uh, she only got apartment for a month while the place aired out. She didn't. She didn't get the new house. She risked her nine-year-old life and didn't get her new house. And um, then another time, then he was. I think he was almost five. She asked him to play another game, and it's like she was sitting in a chair, and she told him to stand on a spot in the middle of the room. So he's thinking, oh yeah, this. Mommy wants to play a game. He was just, he was the most eager to please her. Maybe that's why he couldn't live with everything in the end. But, uh, so she had him get, stand in the spot in the middle of the room. He's thinking it's a game. And it's like, you can't move from that spot. And then she starts screaming at him. You're, you're dumb. I wish you were never born. All this, and... He's like barely five years old. He starts, he didn't know. Just, he found out this ain't a game game. And he's crying and cry, and like, it's just like his lips are quivering. He's crying. I, I'm in the room. I, I'm not allowed to do anything. I'm, um, I'm only uh, less than two years older than him. So I'm probably barely seven. And so when he starts crying, then she starts calling him a big, baby because he's crying and I think he had to stand in that spot for you know, uh, only seven but <laughs> maybe an hour just hurling insults at him but he thought it was a game just like he thought the fire was a game when he was you know a few years later she'd have him do the fire thought it was a game so yeah he was running from some stuff. Yeah. But I mean, I did, uh, I think after I, after I left home, I did, I did write the elders of some of these other things and I never got a response. But yeah, I guess right, I guess now she, she has the Jehovah Witnesses and I guess we're her former children. Now we have, um, I mean, most of us are pretty good. All, all the five surviving of us. So there's two girls, three boys. Um, but my sister had to take in my youngest brother. He's, he's 32 um, when he was 19 to get him away from my mother because he, um, socially he doesn't interact with the world. And, um, so like he's, she's had him since he was 19. So he's, um, never had a driver's license. He's never kissed a girl. He's, he can't go into the world kind of thing. Like, yeah. He's like, he's a shut in. So, but like when he was born, she was like, my sister was like 17. So, I mean, he's always kind of been a replacement mother for him. But yeah, he just, I mean, he doesn't seem depressed or anything, but I mean, nobody knows he exists, you know. Mm -hmm. he, you know, he said it got, like he only trusts like his nieces and nephews, his siblings. And be and beyond that, he just he, like nobody knows he exists because nobody sees him. So yeah, me and my sister, we look out for our baby brother. We know he's we're never gonna change him, but he seems happy with you know what our relationship we have. But I guess I I feel that you know it's just time to let all this out because yeah. it's been. So many years, I'm just keeping secrets for people who I owe nothing to. And it's your life, you know? So if it's something that you feel inclined to share, 
I think that it's important that you do. And I think too, you know, everybody's story is different and everybody's experience is different, but I feel like the more that it's spoken about, the more it breaks certain stigmas and certain ways that people think about things. Because I think that, like we were saying before we started filming, I feel like there's a lot of things that people don't know about. Like people might not know a lot about Jehovah Witnesses or like, you know, or that kind of thing. Or people might assume that because your parents are brother and sister that you would be one way when you're really fine and you're great. I and know, that's, you that's know, the I, question we get most is, oh, what's wrong with you guys? Right. Or, no, we're all average or even higher. I'd say my baby brothers are higher intelligence than most. Yeah. We didn't have any learning disorders besides, you know, the, the cross eyes and the baby with the dead kidney or like we didn't have a lot of physical mm -hmm. issues. Right. And that's why I think it's, you know, another important part about it is, like I said, kind of breaking that stigma of people being because that was out of your control. You know what I mean? Like yeah. people being judgmental towards you. Like what could you have done to to prevent that? You couldn't have. You weren't even born yet. Yeah. So I, I think that that's important. And I'm, I'm so grateful that you wanted to come on and share your story. I think that it takes a lot of strength and courage to do that um, and, and to be willing to put yourself in a vulnerable position of talking in front of a camera and sharing mm -hmm. your story to mm -hmm. a bunch of random people. But you did such a great job, yeah. really. Yeah, like, like where I come from, what the things I watched in my childhood, I'm just, I'm, of course, everybody should be sensitive to child abuse, but me, I'm super sensitive to certain things. And like now, I, I keep seeing all the stories in the news of the Jehovah Witnesses and child abuse and probably if not for that, if they would have just stopped doing that and changed things, I wouldn't even tell my story, yeah. you know? I mean, but I just can't, I can't stand there's, this is still it's happening still on, to children. Right. And just... And you have a voice. It's sad to watch story, that, so. you know, since I was a little girl, yeah, so it, you has, it hasn't changed, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. So, yeah, I... I probably wouldn't tell my story to anybody if the organization would have stepped up to protect children. And here we are, 2023, they have not made any changes. So right. Well, that's, that's why I had have to, I have to be here, yeah, even though it's exactly. uncomfortable. Yeah, and I, and I think it's great because you, you're becoming that voice for yourself and for other children. And I and other people in general. So I think that that's so important and so special and something that you should be so proud of yourself for. Because that takes a lot to do. And it is, it's a scary thing, especially when it's something you've never done before. Mm -hmm. So I know that, uh, you know, some people would probably be mad that I'm here, but um, at least, I mean, my my children, my sister's my best friend. It's like, I was, it's funny because I, I, I joke with my sister, like she's, three she's three people in one she's my best friend she's my sister and she's my first cousin mm -hmm. that's funny <laughs> it's like i got three people yeah. in one she, she's yeah. just one super person to mm -hmm. me well, that's great but yeah she's she's 50 and i'm 46 and yeah we we, we still have sleepovers mm -hmm. and yeah we very close <laughs> yeah well, you did a great job, and thank you again so much for wanting to come on here and share your story. It means so much to me, seriously. You did great. 